thing I would ask you to, as we go through this today, that you um, approach it with an open mind. So you know the mind is like a parachute. It only, opens, it only works when it's open. And so there's, <laughs> you're going to hear some things that you've probably never heard before, but you need to understand them because they, they've always been in it. And we need to understand our rights so we don't have them. So without going on and on, you don't want to hear me anyway. Let me introduce you, Ron. Can everybody hear me all right? I want to ask if you have a cell phone, please turn it off for consideration of everybody else here. If you need to turn it on, you know, vibrate or whatever the thing. And if you have a call you need to take, then please exit quietly as you can. This is for consideration of everybody else that's here. Uh, first off, good morning. Good morning. That's pathetic. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. I, uh, I want to say what an honor it is to be here to share with you a very, a very important subject matter. Uh, thank you all for coming out. I know this is a Saturday. I know that it costs some money to come to this. But at the end of the day, my prayer is that you would, in fact, understand and be glad that you came. That's my goal. Uh, <clears throat> before we get started, uh, if you would indulge me a little bit of a sidebar issue here. How many veterans do we have here? Would you please stand? <clears throat> would you please stand? And I want to say to all of you, you're my heroes. And let's give them a hand, okay? I have a thing in my file that I want to share with you. It is, it is the veteran, not the preacher, who gives us the freedom of religion. It is the veteran and not the reporter that gives us the freedom of the press. It is the veteran, not the poet, who gives us the freedom of speech. It is the veteran, not the campus organizer, who has given us the freedom to assemble. It is the veteran, not the judge, who has given us the right to a fair trial. It is the veteran, not the policeman, who has given us the right to vote. It is the veteran who gave us the right to salute our flag. It is the veteran who serves under that flag so that we may have freedom. One day a young boy came to his grandfather who was sitting on his porch on the farm. And the young boy looked up at Grandpa and he said, Grandpa, he said, were you in the war? And Grandpa said, yeah, I was. And the young boy asked him, he said, Grandpa, were you a hero? He said, no. But everyone else in my house. I love that. Okay, I want to digress a little bit. I'd like to take a few minutes <clears throat> to tell you about Ron Gibson. I'm not here to toot my horn. I'm not here to show off to anybody. I'm here because I care. And I care about our country. I care about our rights. And I care about our people who are being led down a dead end street. And so I want to give you a little background. <clears throat> I grew up on a ranch in Southern Oregon. My dad was a cattle rancher. Raised cattle and horses and hay, and I learned to work. My mother and my dad uh, were staunch constitutionalists. They believed in the principle of that, and the very fact that I had those roots instilled a desire in my heart to continue the furtherance of the education of what our Constitution is and means. And I want to clarify something. The Constitution gives you not one single right. People go, you're kidding me. 
No, I'm not here. Our Constitution reaffirms your inalienable rights. In other words, your inalienable rights are God-given. You and I are a product of our Creator. That's why you're sovereign. And it makes me mad as hell when I see these politicians and all of these groups that claim in us sovereigns that were domestic terrorists. And when we get into the subject matter today, you're going to want to be a sovereign. And you're going to want to claim a sovereign. <clears throat> because without sovereign rights, you have no rights. Okay? And I think everybody in this room can testify to the fact that there's something dreadfully wrong in our nation. And not just here, but around the world. And one of those elements that we deal with is our land. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit. But I want to share a little bit with you about my background. As I shared, I grew up on a ranch, learned to work hard. My dad used to point his finger, not at me, but at it signified a number of things. Pay attention. And number two, wisdom comes from there. And he said, Butch, that was my nickname. He said, whatever you do in life, he said, do what's right. He said, never mind about being right. He said, just do what's right. And he said, if you'll do what's right, that usually, in most instances, takes care of who's right. And I have found that to be true in all of my 67 years of life. I went to a little four-room school, brick uh, grade school, had two classes in each room. It's a historic building today. I guess maybe I'm historic too. But... <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> We produced a number of valedictorians out of that little country school, and I'm proud to have gone there. <clears throat> I went to Grants Pass High School, graduated in 1965, and then from there I went to become an optometrist, or wanted to become an optometrist. And Pacific University at Forest School in Oregon is a private school, and nobody told me, so I drove all the way up there to register and the registrar's office looked at me and said, no. I said, why not? He said, because there's a two-year waiting list to get into that school. I said, oh, my. So that kind of dumped that in the toilet. <clears throat> so then I decided that I'd go to engineering school, and so I went to engineering school. My secondary studies was constitutional law, and I love it. And I love constitutional law because it's based upon this book. It's called the Bible. And from this book, we've derived our forefathers with this book. You with me? One of the tragic things that we have allowed to happen in our country is that we have lost our honor. <clears throat> and I use the analogy that some people go to church and the person next to you will pray for you on Sunday and they will pray upon you come Monday. Second Chronicles 7.14 and my Bible says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and confess their sin and seek my face, I will hear from them from heaven and I will heal your land. Amen. I see people move into town, build an eight foot fence because they don't want to see the neighbor and they don't want to see the neighbor to see them. If you really stop there, it's kind of sick. Because the Bible tells us that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we have a very gross misunderstanding about the word love. We think it's all mushy and the feeling. It isn't that at all. Not that it can't be a part of that. Don't misunderstand me. 
But to love your neighbor means that if he has need, you move in and you help him. And you do everything you can without demanding something in return. Grace my heart. In law school, we would do what's called mock trials. And it's amazing how a case can get manipulated. And in administrative law, I, I'm schooled in constitutional law, not administrative law. I deal with it a lot, but that's not my training. And in that training, it shows you how easy and how subtle and how manipulative your rights can be taken from you. I never forgot it. And I vowed that if I had the opportunity to share with people, that I would try to remember and encourage them to make sure that you maintain your rights. And the way you do that is helping your neighbor and help him to maintain his, to help him if he has need. And so then I joined the Marine Corps. I was not the drafted. I wanted to serve my country. I spent four years in the Marine Corps and spent my tour in Vietnam. I was involved in some of the heaviest fighting in Vietnam at the time. Seen a lot of death in my life. Last nine months in the Marine Corps, I was selected to be a body escort. Some of you may know what that is, some may not. I brought home dead bodies to the family. Doesn't get any tougher than that, except for the families. And I learned something else about that too, that the price of freedom is a tremendous price that's paid for it. And one of the elements that God has given us, and that is the element of land and land ownership. And in my book, I address the issue of where the concept and the principle of land ownership comes from. And it comes from that book by Almighty God. It goes clear back to the first part of Genesis. And if you look in Isaiah chapter 60, verse 21, in the middle of that, God said, I will give my people the land and they will possess it forever. And as we get into land patents in the class here today, I'm going to show you, and maybe some of you know, maybe a lot of you do not, that that phrase in the land patent came from Isaiah chapter 60, verse 21. In other words, God is saying, I want you to have your own land, I want you to own your own land, and I want you to have peace and serenity there. That's what a home in your land is to be. Not just for production, not just this or that. When you read scripture, and I'm an avid student of my Bible, I don't know it all, I'm not trying to tell you that at all. But I've learned some very valuable principles from that. And so you folks are here today to learn more and hear more about patents, and I would love to get started. Can we do that? Yes. Okay, thank you. I want to address the Bible and our Constitution again. This book is derived from this book. Okay? Our Bill of Rights comes from principles of the Bible. Our American flag comes from Scripture. So we have a very deep-rooted uh, foundation in our country here about our Christian heritage. And there are people who claim that we don't have that at all. And if I were to take you to Washington, D.C., and I can show you point to point to point to point. When you back up and look at it, it's a cross. It's a cross. That excites me. I want to share a thought with you. When we talk about patents, 
We talk, how many have heard the word colonial title, colonial patent? You ever heard that? Some of you have. Colonial comes from the old English law, and it means the king's land. Okay? The king's land. The king owned all the land. And therefore, when the barons began to pressure them, and the common people were encouraging the barons of which to relinquish some of that land so that they could own their land, God put in the heart of most every man their own land. They have his own piece of land. You women, you're nesters, you need a place to set up house and a home. God laid that all out. It's all laid out. And we have allowed through laziness, a good part, that we don't study. We'll watch the Sunday evening news. We'll look at the internet. But we won't take time to find out what our rights are or how to maintain our rights. I've read numerous cases in the federal court. I do a lot of research in that area. The federal judges have said over and over, you don't know your rights, you don't have any rights. And it's true, isn't it? You don't know what to do. You don't know how to do it. You don't know what the cause and effect of it. So the unknown creates an element in human beings called fear. Okay? We fear the IRS. We fear the government. We fear losing our job. And not that some of that shouldn't be concerned. But in my Bible tells me that Jesus said, fear not. 366 times. I think it's pretty important if he made that much of an effort. You know, fear ends when faith begins. I want you to take your book just very quickly and after every chapter that I have put together in this book, there is a note and comment page. And as we address the subject matter within those chapters, there's about 35, 36 different subject matters here. If you want to write notes, what I'd like to do is when later on this afternoon, we have one gentleman that he's going to leave early, so I'll let him ask some questions. But I want to reserve the, most of the questions if we can. So if you have questions, write them down in each one of the study matter. Every one of the chapters has got a note and comments page there. Okay? If you would, turn to page four. And I mentioned down about two-thirds of the way, it says, the right of land ownership comes from the Bible, Genesis chapter 28, verses 13, 14, and 15, and Genesis 47. I quoted you another one. And right below that, it says, the land patent is known in law as the letter patent. Patents are issued by the United States government, for those of you who may not know, was the way of dispersing the lands held in trust by the United States government to the private sector. To, in other words, to you, the individual. And so they did it by this thing called a letter patent. In most cases, it's a single page, just like a letter you send to somebody you want to communicate. The power and the authority and the jurisdiction of that document is phenomenal. And we don't use patents uh, language in our everyday life now. And I want to give you a little bit of history. Up until about 1944, when you bought a piece of land, you got the entire history, what we call the title or abstract of title as it's referred to. Okay? And that was toward the end of the war. And the attorneys got together and the bankers got together, and the title company got together, said, man, we've we got to change something here. 
So they did. What they did when they bought a piece of land and took the documents to the title company to be recorded, they took those titles and they reissued a warranty deed. How many of you are familiar with a warranty deed? That warranty deed provides you with absolutely no ownership in that land. It's called color of title, which means it's a phony. It resembles it, they represent it, but the true fact, it is not ownership. It's an equity interest in the land. So the states took these land letter patents and they put them in an archive file and now they classify this as being under administrative jurisdiction. Two jurisdictions. There is common law jurisdiction, constitutional jurisdiction, whatever you want to call it, and administrative. Whenever you hear the word administrative, it means corporation. When you hear the word federal in anything other than the name of a certain banks have used that, but they're private corporations. I want you to write something down. And when you get to your computer, I want you to look up the Act of 1871. Now there are numerous acts that fall under that. But go to the one where Congress unlawfully incorporated the United States and made Washington, D.C. a federal district. Okay? At that point in time, from then on, they changed the names. They call it the District Court of the United States instead of the United States District Court. They use exactly the same words, the same letters, but they turn it 180 years. The people, they didn't know what that meant. Our original Constitution, by our forefathers, said the Constitution for the United States of America. There was dissension in the ranks even then. And there was pushing and shoving and shoving and jiving. Then they wrote a volume two constitution. You know that Montana has two constitutions. Oregon has two constitutions. Washington has two constitutions. One of them is called the organic and the other is called the volume one. And in that volume one, they substitute the word for to of. Now in law, when the word for is used in the context that it's used, it means dominant. Okay? Are you folks familiar with dominant and servient rights? Dominant means that it has a higher right, has more power, more authority, okay? When they substituted that and switched that one word, it meant that the Congress and the Senate and the, and the President could circumvent that. They promoted to us all these years of me growing up, oh, we got to follow the Constitution. They did it only if they wanted to. Now they're bold enough, they just totally ignore it. And that's what you and I are dealing with today, folks. You're dealing with a situation to where you have a rogue government, and I'm going to say something that a lot of you may not even understand, and I hope I can explain it clear enough. In Washington, D.C., in the state capitol here in Montana, in your county government, your city government, there is not one official occupying that seat that is a true government employee, whether elected or hired. You're saying, what? And I'll tell you why. The city's incorporated. When they incorporate, you're dealing with a corporate structure. You're not dealing with the government. They claim it's a government. They act as a government. But their stuff goes on behind the scene. They never tell you. And I have investigated numerous of these situations. One of them, the direction I was talking about yesterday, called a CAFR account. Very interesting when you get into that. 
certified annual report. And that's just one of the many. And when you have a corporate structure, then in essence there's an element in law that states very clearly is throughout all law. And that is, you cannot have jurisdiction over that which you do not create or have not created. Do you catch that? You do not have authority over that which you do not create. So when these cities and counties and, and states and the federal government became corporations, they created a new you. And they did it in capital letters. Look at your driver's license. Look at your social security card. Look at your bank uh, check. An IRS correspondence or whatever. And if you don't understand that and know what to do about it, then you are subject to it by what's called in law tacit agreement. That means you agree by your silence. That's what's happened to our land ownership. Okay? Look at your tax bill. It'll be in your capital letter name. And that means that they consider you to be a subject. And I'm going to put it bluntly. A slave. We want to be free. And really restoring your land right and your land position is the first step and the most critical one that you'll ever do to do that very thing. There's an old saying, unless you own, land, own property, then you are property. Okay? Most of you know that you've tried to build something on your land. you got all these rules and restrictions and, and, and obstacles and they let you move forward as long as you pay. Folks, that's not freedom. That's in bondage. And we need a lawful and proper government. I'm not anti-government. Don't misunderstand me. But we don't have one at any level in our country. And people don't know that because nobody's ever been bold enough to stand up and tell them the truth. My Bible tells me that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Because if you're working in a vacuum, you're working under a lie or a misrepresentation, it's a dead end street. Okay? So the authority and jurisdiction. Now I want to address that subject with you for a moment. <clears throat> An old English law when our forefathers came to this country they came here with a burning desire to be free. Free of religion, freedom of speech, freedom to own the land, etc., etc. And they brought with them the concept of an allodial title. We call them paths, but they're allodial. And if you look on the front of your book on page four, at the very bottom, it lines. Excuse me, the bowl oh, just above that. The following is referenced from the Commissioner of the General Land Office book, page 28 and 29, dated 1870. And I want you to read with me just that in the next part of the next page. The individual title derived from the government includes the entire transfer of ownership. That's what a lodial means. You get everything. Not only do you get the land, but you get the authority and jurisdiction. Okay? Very important elements. You don't just get the land. You get authority and jurisdiction. It is purely, on the next page, page five, a lodial with all. You notice that word all? What does all tell you? What does all tell you? Everything. Everything. Total. Complete. Without reservation or reserve. So that's how important this land patent stuff is. 
And our forefathers designed it that way. They knew what oppression was. They knew what it meant to have for a moment and then have it taken away because you don't follow the very narrow, strict line that somebody else is putting demand on. Does that sound familiar in our culture today? Sure does, doesn't it? One of the things that I like to share with people, our Constitution is not a self-executing document. Did you hear what I said? Our Constitution is not a self-executing document. It lays out the restriction. That's why that constitutional book is small. It gives the government, by we the people, who are the bosses, we're the kings, very limited latitude in which they're to function, and they're to do it at your and I's direction. That election three years ago, whatever it was, two and a half years ago, and one of the local candidates wanted to go to Washington, D.C. And so we had a public meeting. And I stood up and I said, I have one question for you. And he said, what's that? I said, do you in your proposed administration willing to follow the Constitution to the letter? Next question. Did not even want to answer it. Told me everything. And I made a comment before I sat down. I said, you know the problem with people who are power seekers like yourself. And that is the fact that when you leave, if you get elected, you not only leave Oregon, but you leave us, the people. And you go back and you do your thing and you make your underhanded deals. And I said, my Bible tells me that one day you will stand before Almighty God and have to make an attempt. I want to show you this. How many of you have seen this? Yeah. This is a picture of the proposed land grab by the Agenda 21 program. The red is signifies that no human being is to occupy that land. Okay? Totally void of human beings, either recreational and anticipation. There you go. In a book we have back yeah. there. Okay, thank you. The yellow, guess what the yellow is? That's the buffer zone to the red. Very, very limited activity that can go on there. I'll pass that around. Did you take a look at it? In other words, folks, I'm trying to tell you, we better wake up. We better wake up. And I'll tell you why. That's part of it. But they're coming after you and your land, your savings, your retirement, and they want you in bondage. Do you know that the Agenda 21 program is to eliminate three-quarters of the world's population? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be you? Is it going to be me? Who survives, who lives, who gets selected or not? we got some people with a sick mind, folks. Mm -hmm. They want to take everything you have. It's like a greedy man. The more money he gets, the more he wants. You folks here, I don't know if you understand how significant it is that you're here today. You people, if you would take what you learned here today and you would go out into your respective communities or wherever you're from and start planting the seed. My Bible tells me that God gives seed to the sower, but he gives a bountiful harvest to the receiver. Because the principle in Scripture is that give and it shall be given unto you. And if we're willing to sow the seed of knowledge and information, knowledge properly applied equals wisdom. Okay? You look up in your Bible in James 1.5. 
God's head of all. <clears throat> all ye who seek wisdom of God, ask, and he will give it abundantly. He's not stingy with wisdom. And yet, rather than spend a few hours or a few minutes even in the week's time and read our Bible and get and on our knees, we'll watch Dancing with the Stars and we'll watch a Sunday football game, and then we wonder why we have no rights. You've got to stand up, folks, and defend your right. If you're going to have rights, you need to be willing to defend it. If you want liberty, you need to be able to defend it. I want to share a story with you. Thank you. Thank you. Pardon me, I need to... When I was in the Marine Corps, we got pinned down 128 degree weather and we ran out of water. My heavy equipment operator that was in charge of a 12 man construction platoon. We went into areas in Vietnam that nobody else had ever been. We took horrendous casualties. And so when we got pinned down, I had to get some water for my men, find a way to sneak out through the jungle. <clears throat> Sun beating down 98, 99% humidity, incredibly hot and humid. And I knew we were in trouble. My operators were drinking between 8 to 12 gallons of water a day per man. Constant inflow, constant sweat. Shoes would rot off, our underwear would rot. I finally got out around the perimeter where we were pinned down and the drive to have water. And you folks are dealing with a water issue here in Montana. We're dealing with it in Oregon. We're dealing with it all over the western United States. I saw waterfalls. I saw fountains. And I knew I was in trouble. I knew it. But the drive to get a drink of water is phenomenal. It's like the fighting for life is phenomenal. Everywhere I went where there was a pool of water or nothing but jungle or a little old patch of grass. And I remember finally finding a little pool about from here to where these two gentlemen are sitting in the back corner. And I remember falling down in there on my knees. Put my hands in the water, about four inches deep. The leeches started crawling up on my hands. And I remember looking at that and I thought, wow, look at that. That's kind of neat. You're losing, <laughs> you know. Sun's cooking your brain. I drank out of that dirty rice paddy, felt like I was drinking boiling water. Within about, and I don't really know because I went unconscious, but my tonsils blew up, just exploded like a hand grenade. And the blood came out of my mouth and I went down. Next thing I know, I'm looking up and there's this funny thing going around. I found out later it was a medevac helicopter. They all made a visit to Da Nang Hospital, propped me up, no Novocaine, no nothing. And I remember when I was coming in and out of consciousness, that the doctor was saying, hold him still, hold him still, open his mouth. And they took a long, I didn't even see him because everything was a blur. But the corpsman told me later, they took those long curved scissors, suits or whatever they're called, you medical people know better than I do. But anyway, I'll call them scissors. And started cutting my tonsils out. No Novocaine, no nothing. And I'm telling you, I can't even describe the pain to you. They severed my vocal cords totally on the right side of my throat. Halfway severed them on this side. But five years before I could get a normal conversation. Okay? And I'm not saying that's what to toot my horn. I'm just saying what I saw in that hospital 
is indescribable. What I saw on the battlefield is indescribable. After I got out of the hospital, I spent 28 days strapped to a bed on my side, hanging half over, bleeding into a five-gallon bucket. I got intravenous blood coming in, and I'm bleeding it out as fast as they put it in. Could not swallow, didn't have any water, and the psychological effect of that being what I had already been through that was vivid in my mind about no water branded something in my mind and in my heart. Part of why I studied water law. Water is life. And we better take the steps, folks, to protect it. And the land patent is the start of that, and I'll get into that in a bit. And I didn't mean to get off on this thing. The focus today is not me. But I'm just trying to illustrate a point. Now, <clears throat> I do a lot of this, and forgive me for doing that, but it's the only way that I can get my vocal cords to work. You'll notice my voice breaks at times. I can't help it. But anyway, I want to share a story with you. I study, and I study, and I study. Made a lifetime of study. I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with girls do. <laughs> <laughs> A little humor there on the road, too. <laughs> but in my study of our American history, and I love American history, some of it has been so distorted. George Washington, during the Revolutionary War, started out with 35,000 men. Okay? Men who had a passion for freedom. Within less than about two years, he was down to 1,500. Listen to this, folks. Over 800 of those men had no shoes. In the middle of the winter, freezing weather, blinding snowstorm, had no shoes. They wrapped sacks around there and anything they could do, and they tie up with string, whatever they could find, vines, so that they would have something to walk on. And they said, Mr. Washington, what do we do? We're beat up, we're lack of material, we're hungry, we're tired, we're cold, and we're demoralized. The great leader that that man was said, let's get on our knees. That's what they did. <coughs> And they petitioned Almighty God for divine wisdom. When they finished their prayer, George Washington got up. And he said, we're going after the enemy. He said, okay. Crossed the river in the dead of night, black as coal, freezing weather, blizzard, snowstorm, and no shoes. Unbelievable. About 11 o'clock the following day, they caught up with the enemy. About 1,500 British were laying there sleeping. They killed over 800, took 737 or 35, whatever the exact number was. Within two weeks of that victory, they had 15,000 volunteers. That's what I hope you folks bring to the table when you leave here today. Folks, this is not a chore. It's an opportunity to salvage and to maintain freedom. I do marriage counseling. I've done it for about 30 years. And it's amazing what comes in my door when you have people that are emotionally at odds with each other. And I address the fact you've got a choice here. You can be bitter or better. You can be a victim or you can be victorious. Every situation is a stumbling block or a stepping stone, I said, and it's your decision to make. The real problem is not what you're claiming or think it is. The real problem is your attitude about what you're dealing with. Okay? George Washington then went on to defeat the British. 
I want to share another little story with you. We'll get further in. Because I want you to understand what's at stake here, folks. Tremendous. The very existence of our nation may come down to you. It may. How many of you have sung our national anthem? We sing that at sporting events. We sing that at our church. We sing it at other sporting deals or rodeos or whatever. I want to tell you the story behind that. Francis Scott Key was a lawyer from Baltimore. And Washington had commissioned him to go out to the British ship and negotiate a one-to-one -one release of the British prisoners for the American prisoners. That was his commission. The British Admiral's ship was about a quarter of a mile offshore. They were after the port of Baltimore. And the way to get that, they had to destroy or get the United States people to surrender. Okay? They gave an ultimatum. You bring that flag down. I won't bombard Fort McHenry. He said no. So he negotiated all day long until about 2.30 in the afternoon. And finally, the British Admiral agreed. Okay. He said, I'll trade it one for one. But he said, tomorrow won't make any difference anyway. And Francis Scott Cheese asked him, he said, why not? And he says, because before darkness tonight, the majority of the entire British fleet is going to line up in my ship and we're going to bombard that fort. And we're going to blow it off the face of the earth. And Francis Scott Key said, you can't do that. The British Admiral said, why not? He said, because it's predominantly not even a military fort anyway. It's a storage facility, men and women and children there that are not involved in this. He said, then tell them to take that flag down. And again, Francis Scott Key said no. Pretty soon he looked upon the horizon and it looked like little dark dots. And in a few hours it got closer and closer. And just before dark, the entire British fleet was lined up. Cannons loaded and ready to bombard Fort McHenry. And the British Admiral said one more time, you take that flag down and I won't attack. He said no. He gave the command and the British Navy, the bulk of it, bombarded Fort McHenry with everything they had. All through the night, they could see the bombs bursting. When it went off, he could tell that the rampart and the flag had taken multiple direct hits. And the British Admiral came up to Francis Scott Keyes and he said, I don't understand you people. He said, well, just bring the flag down and the bombardment will stop. And Francis Scott Keyes remembered something that George Washington told him. He said, we, as the people who want to be free, and as Christians would rather die on our feet than live on our knees. And the admiral got furious. He said, unload everything we have on that fort. And they did for 25 hours. Unmerciful. Human life meant nothing. All for the cause of the, of the king and the queen and all of the other garbage that goes along with politics. During the bombardment at night, the prisoners were in the bottom of the Admiral ship. Francis Scott Key would go down and the prisoners in that sinkhole said, what's going on? What's going on? Is the flag still up? Is the flag still up? And he said, yes, it is. At about 3 o'clock in the morning, Francis Scott Key started to back down into the hole to give them an update. 
And he said, all I could hear were men praying. God, keep that flag flying. Don't let it fall. Don't let it fall. He in the picture. Morning came at about nine o'clock. Francis Scott Keys got in a boat and went ashore. And he went into Fort McHenry, and when he came around the corner, he got the shock of his life. The flag was still up, the rampart was leaning, the flag was ripped and torn, but it was still flying. And what he found was the men's bodies in stacks, very neatly placed, who had held that rampart up by hand. Okay? And when they died, others removed them and took their place. Wow. Wow. Freedom comes at great price. I lost 13 men in 12 days. Last nine months in the Marine Corps, I was selected to be a body escort. Took Vietnam casualties home to their family. Well, I tell you what, put that set of shoes on and wear them. But what an honor. You, you military, military people, service people, men, whatever, you stood up. Hallelujah to you. You are my heroes. Freedom is not free, folks. It's not free. Okay, back to our path. <clears throat> the oil with all the incidents pertaining to the title as substantial as in the infancy of the Teutonic civilization. Following the wake of this fundamental reform, the state land laws, several others were constituted appropriate. The statute was never adopted in the public states, and hence the complex distinction between the use of the trust has never embarrassed our jurisprudence. You know what it's saying there? It's saying you better not come and you better not infringe upon the landowner because it's his and you have no right to affect his land or his peace or his property or anything. That's what it's saying. Now we've got so many land regulations, you can't even breathe. Here's the cover a photocopy of the cover of the book that I got that Elodio quote out so that you know that it isn't something Ron's just making up. It comes out of the very general land office publication. They're the ones that write the, the, the regulation and how to implement the land patents at the direction of Congress. Okay? I want to just, and I've given you quite a bit of the, I'm jumping around here, so bear with me. An overview on page seven of the land patent. This is just a little short, kind of an introductory thing, if I can put a title to it. The disposal of a land patent is conclusive evidence of the right title and interest in a particular tract of land granted to a private party and from the United States government. In addition to the granting of the land to the grantee, that's what a person is recipient of that because they grant and the recipient is a grantee, okay? The grantee, he also receives all of the authority and jurisdiction relating to that land. This is what is called a true title. 
Remember earlier in our discussion, we talked about the fact of a warranty deed? That's no title at all. That's just a document showing that you have an equity interest in that land. The land comes to, to you from treaty law. A lot of people do not understand what that even means. In other words, when there's negotiations or agreement between nations, they're called treaties. And treaties are law of the land. And if you look at the Constitution under Article 6, Clause 2 is called the Supremacy Clause. Okay? I want to read that to you. And I think you'll see where I'm going. This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made pursuant thereof, and all treaties made, of which shall be made, under the authority of the United States, shall be, shall in law means that it's mandatory. May means that you can be discretionary about it. So it will be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. And the thing in the Constitution and the laws of any state to the contrary are non-withstanding. Now I want to ask the question, what does that tell you? I want you to think, folks. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm trying to get you to think. What does that tell you? Who is bound? The judge is in it. In how, in what areas? Every state. And yet we have judges out there who are taking people's land by virtue of foreclosure, and we're going to get into that, that have no lawful authority to do any of that. A mortgage <coughs> and your land are not one and the same. We're going to get into that in the memorandum of law. They are not one and the same. And the attorneys and the courts and the legislature have all just lumped them together. You miss a payment, we'll punish you, we'll take your land. Absolutely pathetic. And I'll tell you why. Because it's a violation of the supremacy clause and it's a violation of the intent of Congress. And we're going to get into that. Congress intended for the poor man to get a twice a grant. It's free. The poor man couldn't afford it. So Congress said, we're going to set it up to where these people are free and own their own land and do what they want to do to be production, productive. That opportunity came by having land and owning land. Have you ever wondered why the United States has been such a powerhouse for so many years? If for one, number one reason is because of private land ownership. Okay? There's an old saying. Maybe I shared with it earlier. You don't own property, you probably are property. That's why God in his word puts such an emphasis on the ownership of land. It's important, folks, and you need to protect it, and you need to defend it. Because the way it's designed, it belongs to you, and you, and you, and on down the line. And we've gotten lazy, and we've gotten sloppy, and we've gotten ignorant. And I say that respectfully, but still, we don't study. Years ago, the educational system was required in all 12 grades to read from that book, the Bible. It's our moral compass. It's our rudder. God said, those who honor me, I will honor them. I'm not ashamed of my faith. The Bible said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. That horrified me to death. To go on my last day and come and said, depart from me, I know you're not. 
going to be a lot of people in that. Because we think we know best. In this country, we've allowed God to be pushed out of our government. We've allowed God to be pushed out of our schools. We've allowed God to be taken down in the representation of crosses. And we wonder why. And I have a lot of criticism of the church. Most of them, not all. You folks in this part of the country have got a pastor that you may need to thank God of, Chuck Baldwin. And I'm not here to promote Chuck, but I can tell you that's a godly man who understands the whole segment of all of this stuff. <clears throat> the middle of the page, well, the one before, it says your land on page uh, seven. It said, your land comes to you from treaty through the land patent. This is critical. The land patent uh, <clears throat> secures the treaty's authority and jurisdiction. Okay? That's why the courts are bound. The judges are bound. Because it's treaty law. We either have the law of the land or we don't. And we do. And so as a result of that, when you receive a land patent or you bring your land patent forward, you get the land, you get the authority and the jurisdiction. It means that you have the total say of the, that you're king of your land. And I'm going to make a statement here. <coughs> we need to stop acting like slaves and start acting like kings. Okay? When you yield to somebody who claims he has dominance over you, you need to stand up. The Bible says expose sin right where it is. You can govern. That's what a constitutional republic is, of self-governance. The democracy is defined by two wolves and a baby lamb voting on what to have for lunch. Let me tell you what a republic is. A republic has two wolves and a lamb with his armed weapon saying, you're not having me for lunch today, tomorrow, or ever. If I can give you that analogy. We've always got somebody out there who wants to have control of you. There's a proverb in the Bible that said, never was a lion so vicious as an ungodly man with power. Boy, do we see that today, don't we? <clears throat> the land patent is issued by the United States government to the grantee, and the land patent stands forever. I want to repeat that. Your land patent stands forever. That's why on every patent, every single one of them, it says it's hereby granted and it gives a name to their heirs and assigns forever. <laughs> Had a very lengthy discussion with an attorney in Florida the other day on behalf of a client of hers. And I've been called on many occasions to be an expert witness in court cases having to do with land patents and property rights and right-of-ways and water rights and whatever. <clears throat> and she kept coming up with this administration. The guy's done his land patent, by the way. And he has a mortgage, and he's struggling. And she's trying to defend him. And I said, you're doing the wrong defense. She said, what do you mean? And I said, you're trying to make a constitutional argument in an administrative court. And I said, they're not allowed. She said, what do you mean? I said, the patent comes with authority and jurisdiction. And that authority and jurisdiction stands forever, and its authority comes from treaty law. That treaty doesn't come from administrative jurisdiction. Okay? And so we finally got her to see the difference. Two and a half hours trying to explain it. And I've had a lot of trouble and I want to say this respectfully, but with a lot of attorneys and judges, the attitude in a lot of them, not all, there's some dang good attorneys out there, and I'm not here to throw stones at attorneys, 
but a number of them that I have met try to portray that they're smarter than you and I are. And I don't know it all. I don't claim to know it all. But I'll tell you what, I study, and I have been in many, many, many debates having to do with land patents. And I can hold my own. This attorney made the comment, well, how do I know that what you're telling me is right, that it doesn't fall under an administrative jurisdiction? I said, very simple. I said, show me where the forever clause and authority in a land patent was ever removed. Got stone quiet on the other end of the phone. Now, I wasn't trying to throw stones at her. Pretty sharp gal, really. She then began to see, and that's what I hope I help you folks do, to see the power and the authority and the jurisdiction of a land patent. How many of you in here uh, own land? By that I mean have bought up, bought up. I don't care if it's paid for, but own it, man. Okay, very good, thank you. You might give some consideration when we're all done here today about bringing forth your land patent title. This gentleman here asked me earlier kind of a bullet point of what is the benefits of a land patent. I want to go through that with you because very good question. Very good question. Number one, to bring your land patent, it's proof of your sovereignty. You and I are sovereigns, and by law, only sovereigns can own land. I didn't say real estate, I said land. Real estate is an administrative term, and it's used in the administrative rules and statutes and codes. Okay? The second thing to issuing or bringing your land patent forward is the very fact that you have protection. Protection. You say, well, protection from what? And I can honestly tell you, if you defend it from almost anything, that's an attack upon you and your land. Because it is instituted by God and is reaffirmed in the Constitution under Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2, 432, and it's called the land disposal portion of the Constitution. And in that disposal, it is a authority, but it's also a directive to Congress to dispose of the lands to you and I, so that we can acquire that land and go be productive, raise our families, raise a garden, raise cattle, cut timber, whatever the issue is. And I want to say something here, and I want you to listen carefully. All all, all wealth comes from the ground. Amen. Okay? That a very interesting, I don't like to call it an argument, but it was almost that. But a guy that owned a whole chain of McDonald's, very wealthy man, he said, that's not true. I said, that's not true. He said that all wealth comes. He said, I make about $17 million a year selling hamburgers. I said, really? I said, I have a couple questions for you. He said, what's that? I said, where'd you get the beef? Where'd you get the buns? Where'd you get the paper? Where did the building, the blocks, the bricks come from that made it? He said, how do you get to work? He said, to drive. I said, where, what made the car? Where did the products that made the car? He looked at me like a deer in the headlights. <laughs> Wealth comes from on top of the ground, trees, crops, whatever, or comes from under the ground in the form of mineral development. One of the patent issues, we're going to get into that in a minute, and I'll share with you, there are 11 different types of patents. 
And that patent, the mineral estate, is phenomenal. And it is so misunderstood, it is so abused, the political sector think, we're going to shut you miner down. I have a film that I would share with Joel. Joel, where are you? There he is. As I, <clears throat> and the title of this film is called Out of the Rock. Phenomenal. And in that film, it's a mining educational film. The question is asked, what would your life be like without mining? Okay? Doesn't matter your political affiliation here, folks. Better set that aside for the point I'm trying to make. And it's asked again, and then the camera focuses in on a woman who's in her kitchen. That's a woman's domain, isn't it? Her kitchen. Wow, that's great. I thank God for you, women. And the question is asked one more time. What happens without money? The clock on the back wall disappeared. The toaster disappeared. The coffee pot disappeared. The window disappeared. The countertops disappeared. The stove disappeared. The oven. <coughs> Everything in that home poof, was gone. And if they'd taken it to the degree that it rightly should have gone, there'd been no house. You wouldn't have had them address, polyester, shoes, Glasses, your glasses are a product of a mine product, result of a mine product. Your watch, your computer, your cell phone, fiber optic, paint, goes on and on and on, tennis. And one of the patents is, is, is mineral patents. Because of that came out after the Civil War, our forefathers understood the very fact that we better protect the mineral estate. And I'll tell you, one of the main reasons why it's so important. It is tied directly and significantly to national defense. Okay? How do you set a radar unit up to, in, to detect incoming enemy aircraft or submarines or build a submarine or an airplane or weapons or canteens? You're interested, go to your computer and look Title 30, Section 1801 and 1803. You'll find that it's tied to national security, and rightfully so. Okay? <clears throat> Back to page 7. The American people, newly established sovereigns in this republic, after the victory, achieved during the Revolutionary War became complete owners of the land and beholden to no one. Getting back to your question, sir, about the, about the benefit, the bullet point. You're beholden to nobody. No building permits, no taxes, nothing. Now, having said that, I want to make freedom comes with responsibility. And freedom comes with accountability. So what you do with your land, don't hurt your neighbor. Okay? Because you don't want him hurting you. That's why you work together. You talk. You have coffee together. You invite him over for dinner. What's your plan about your life? What can I do on mine to help you? And vice versa. We've lost that. We've lost our honor, I believe. We've lost our honor. And there's nothing going to get right until we take personal responsibility and we reestablish our honor. When you give your word to something, you don't need a contract. If our handshake doesn't bind you and I, the paper we wrote it on is worthless. Isn't it? Amen. It's worthless. If your words go to no good, then your signature is no good. I was talking to Rex this morning coming in, and I write a lot of contracts and have for years. Studied a lot of contract law. Most of my, con the, the most pages that I've ever had in a contract was three pages. But I try to make it one, or maybe two. You're saying, well, why is that? I spell out the items, who's involved, 
what the terms and condition is, what the time frame is, and we both sign it. Attorneys have got into the practice in a lot of instances of putting all these legalese all into something to fight over. When in fact the whole focus of the contract is missed. Oh, let's fight over this plastic that's sitting in this breast instead of this one. How dare you? That's done all the time. One thing I learned in law school that is taught, not in my class, but it was taught to us that it's done in administrative law school. Controversy is an attorney's best friend. I'll charge you 200 bucks an hour for something he could solve if he would put his heart in it and really look at the, the protection of the individual. Because one day those attorneys and judges will stand before God. The Bible says that your sin will ever be before you. That isn't just the day of the judgment. That means throughout eternity. There's a lot of debate over that issue. I'm not here to cast anything on anybody. But what's in that Bible is either true or it isn't. And if it isn't, we better throw it in the trash. But I've never seen it fail. Never. Psalm 37, verse 25. David said, once I was young, and now that I am old, in other words, he'd spent a lifetime. I have never seen God forsaken. Those who love him, who are called according to his purpose, nor their children go hungry. One verse that says, they are begging for bread. Same thing. He's faithful. The question is, are we? Our handshake. Am I faithful to my commitment to you? Are you faithful to your commitment to me? No matter what the cost, we shook on it. That was my dad. That was my dad. And my mother, too. My dad was a spiritual giant. <clears throat> We're going to take a break in a little bit to let you folks stretch your... Let me finish this out. These freeholders of the original 13 states now held a loyal title to the land that they possessed. <laughs> you want to know about possessory? Go to Title 30, United States Code, Section 53. That has to do with the mineral estate in that particular instance, but it talks about the possessory title. You heard the, the, the term, you know, possession is nine tenths of the law. Okay, that's a possessory right. And there's always somebody going to come along and try to tell you that you don't have a right to possess what's yours. This new and more powerful title protected the sovereigns from unwarranted intrusion or attempted takings of their land. And more importantly, it secured them the right to own an absolute <coughs> perpetuity. What is the word perpetuity? Unending. Getting back to answering some of your questions. You have a piece of property that is to be secured in perpetuity without end. Doesn't that go along with on the patent that it says, to their heirs and assigns forever. There must be something to this stuff then. You look at the Magna Carta, the very fact that the, the term forever relative to the heirs and that is mentioned multiple times. Multiple times. Let's take about a 10 minute break. We're back. Turn to page nine if you would. <clears throat> I want to share with you very quickly so we can move on. These are the different types of land patents. Uh, they're listed. There, there are 11 different types of land patents. And therefore, number one is the cash entry pat uh, patent. That's an entry that covered public lands for which an individual paid cash or its equivalent. There are not very many of these. And the reason being is that 
They did this when there was a need to get the land under private ownership for a particular project or whatever. Land patents were to be issued by virtue in the way of a grant. These are a grant, but they're called a cash entry patent. They were actually paid for, and they're not supposed to be. But there were situations they had to make a concession for, if you please. Number two, credit patents. These patents were issued to anyone who either paid cash at the time of sale or received a discount or paid by credit in an installment over a four-year period. If full payment were not received within the four-year period, the title to the land would revert back to the federal government. That's what a credit patent is. Number three, which most of you are under here, and that's a homestead patent. And a homestead patent allows a settler to apply for up to 160 acres of public land. And if they lived on it for five years and proved of cultivation and improvement, this land did not cost anything per acre. But the settler, excuse me, did pay the filing fee. And most of your lands here are under that type of the land patent. Military warrant patents. Number four, from 1788 to 1855, the United States granted military boundary and warrants as a reward for military service. Thus, warrants were issued to various denominations and based upon the rank and length of service. Number five, mineral patents. This also applies much in Montana as well. The General Mining Law of 1872 defined mineral lands as parcels of land containing valuable minerals in its soil and rock. And there were three types of mineral patents that were issued under that. Number A is a load claim patent. Okay. Contains gold, silver, or other precious metals occurring in veins. In other words, in place rock, if you please. Number B is the placer patent. And the placer patents are minerals not found in veins or loads. Information, no information, load formation, get it right here, Ron. Loose gravel, et cetera. They're called alluvial. In other words, they've been moved by water or glacier. Number C, mill site claim patents are limited to the lands that do not contain valuable minerals. And you could patent up to five acres to do your processing for your mining operation. Okay. Number six on page 10, private land claim patent. The claim based one of the assertions that the claim of this predecessors and interest derived the right while the land was under the domination of a foreign government. Not too many of those either. There are some, but not many. Number seven, railroad patents. A lot of these, a lot of railroad patents. Railroad patents to aid in the construction of certain railroads. The act of September 20th, 1850 granted the state ultimate sections of public land on either side of the rail lines and branches. Number eight, state selection patent. These, each new state admitted to the union was granted 500,000 acres for public land for internal improvements establishment under that act. Number nine, swamp patents. Under the act of September 28th, 1850, lands identified as swamp and overflow lands unfit for cultivation was granted to the state. Once accepted by the state, the federal government had no further jurisdiction over that parcel. Now, I'm going to stop there a minute. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Then what is the EPA doing running around the country, fining people, threatening people, taking people to court on the swamp land issue? Does an agent of the United States government have authority to do that? No. No. See, there's an element in our country of assumed authority. In other words, they just decide that they're going to do it. They just assume they have the authority. Has that been to court? It's kind of like the taxes. Has that been to court? Pardon? Has that issue been to court? Yes. And? Yes. The judges went along with it. Yeah. Let's go on here. Town site patents. 
an area of public land which has been segregated for disposal as the urban development, often subdivisions and blocks, and to further subdivisions into town lots. That's where you get your meets and bounds uh, and, and your lot numbers and all of that, okay? Because there were places that people began to congregate and then therefore those definitions and patents had to accommodate that. Number 11, town lot patent. May be regular or irregular in shape and its acreage varies from that regular subdivision. Then I put a notation on that regular homestead patents, anyone applying for a homestead patent was required to do a mineral examination with the boundaries being claimed for patent to determine whether the minerals were found, whether minerals were found. If minerals were found within that said boundary before the patent issue, then the mineral did not pass with the patent. That's known as a noble decision. I want to read you something. I have a patent here, and it says subject to. Subject to is the reservation on a patent. Okay? Most of the subject to, I can't cross the line, I got in trouble. <laughs> Just kidding. The subject to clause on a patent, and it's important that you understand this, <clears throat> is for the purpose of protecting a proprietary right. In other words, somebody that had a right before the patent was issued. And in that, initially when they issued homestead patents that they just lived on for five years and they issued the patent and come to find out that it was more mineral in character than it was of agricultural use. So Noel, who was the director of the general land office, a lot of conflict came between the miners and the, and the, and the farmers, the agricultural people. And to bring peace to that issue. See, here's an interesting thing, too. You know what the purpose of the law is? Have you ever thought about this? The purpose for law is to bring peace, not controversy. <clears throat> That's why we have the law of God. You stay within those bounds. God said, I'll protect you. I'll watch over you. I'll bless you. And on and on it goes. Okay? But that subject to clause was for the purpose of protecting miners' rights, ditches, ditch right-of-ways, uh, mineral holdings, getting back. The gentleman was telling me here about, about uh, being restricted going into his property. That subject to clause means that they can go down that ditch line, they can go down that right-of-way or whatever it is, and not be hindered by you, the landowner, because it's a proprietary right. First come, first serve, so to speak. Doesn't mean that they own the land, it means that they have a right to use. That, that's on almost, not all, but a great deal of your homestead patents. Okay? <clears throat> the railroads are by far the largest patented landowner in the United States. Almost without question, every railroad land, whether there's a railroad or a siding or whatever, is still under the original patent never been taken out. They're not subject to regulation, and the uh, Transportation Division tries to put rules and regulations against the railroads. The railroads have been accommodated, but they don't have any authority to do that. Okay? Oh, the paragraph, second to the last paragraph on page 10, the reason that being at mineral lands of the United States is, and as of today, considered to be a separate estate, it's known as a subsurface estate versus a surface estate. That's what the subject to clause addressed. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, the mineral is underneath the agricultural ground. The mineral right in these situations to where you have a separate estate, the mineral estate is dominant. In other words, the landowner of the surface 
cannot restrict and friends upon the right to remove the mineral. Now, there's an accountability. Whatever land that is disturbed or any damage that's done, the mineral developer has to pay the surface landowner. That's to keep everything in balance so that the mineral people don't go in and tear it up and leave the landowner with a useless piece of ground because he had a right to the mineral. But again, that's a good neighbor policy, okay? Alrighty, on to page 12. I'm not going to spend much time on the additional land patent information. You can read that when you have time, because we have a lot to cover here today. Uh, I want to read at the bottom of page 12, the last paragraph. It talks about the land patent, and, let, and I quote, This is the only lawful method of a perfect, perfect title can be held by the grantee's name. And there's a court case there, Wilcox versus Jackson. There's a little field versus register, and on and on. And I've got a lot of court cases in this book here, in case you haven't had a chance to look. Okay. Um, on page 14, top of the page, the patent is prima facie conclusive evidence of title. Now that brings up, let's see what I did with that. I'm going to throw a little bit of a trick question here to you. This is an actual copy of a land patent. Okay? And I have a copy of one of mine in the back of it, toward the back of the book. Mm -hmm. This is only the evidence of your title. You're going to what? Everybody think this piece of paper is the title. No, it's not. It's the evidence of your title. Your title is in the law. You with me? And it's an enactment by Congress. We call them congressional acts. And that act of Congress has said that the land will be disposed by a lodial title to the person who applies for it. And if you qualify, then it's yours, lock, stock, and barrel, without any encumbrances, and you get the authority and jurisdiction with it. So they give you evidence of that. And that's called a letter patent. and that's what these are. I have one here from Canada, same thing. Canadian land patents are two pages. For those of you who can see, I'm kind of flinging them around here. But all of these patents, every one of them, without question, says that there are signs, errors, and the signs forever. Now, I'm going to pose a little bit of a hypothetical question. If every patent has that on it, then there must, it must mean something, doesn't it? One would think so, anyway. And it's a reminder to everybody that views a patent that it is in perpetuity, without end. And I've had some heated discussions with judges in chambers relative to this very subject matter. Not a one ever, ever has been able to show me to where the forever clause has ever been removed or that it can even be removed because it cannot. These are perpetual. This patent is just as effective and with authority and jurisdiction and standing today as it was in the 1800s when it was issued. It's a present past, a patent, not a past history. I get government people trying to tell me all the time, oh, those are no good. I have attorneys tell me, oh, you don't use those anymore. They're no good. That's old stuff. My question again, how long is forever? How long is perpetuity? It was intended to be just that, folks, to protect you, the landowner. Okay? Another issue, getting back to your question about the benefits, a land patent cannot be collaterally attacked by anybody except 
the United States government within two years of the date of issue. There's no provision in law to collaterally attack a land patent. Now, I want to talk about mortgages a moment. How many of you have a mortgage on your land? Okay. <coughs> you do. And if a person gets behind in their payment and the mortgage company wants to come and take your land for it, there's no authority in law to take that land. None. 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 Because a mortgage is not a title. A mortgage is a lien position relative to money that has been extended. You understand what I'm saying here? Banks and judges and courts have been treating foreclosures as though the bond between the promissory note and the trustee and the land is one. In default, we take it all. A number of things wrong with that concept, folks. And here it is. Number one, it's a violation of the intent of Congress. Number one. Number two, it's in violation of the Supremacy Clause. Number three, it violates the Forever Clause relative to the land patent, the letter patent, that is concrete, if I can use the term, in law. It's by a congressional act that's backed up by the power of treaty. Now, I'd like anybody to show me who think a mortgage has a right to come and take the land. Another problem with that is that it's an unjust enrichment. There's an element of law called unjust enrichment. That means when you do something relative to your action or an action in, in court of which you have undue benefit to you that you don't rightly deserve. You with me? Yes. The mortgages are enforceable. You have to speak up. I can't hear you. The mortgages are enforceable against warning deeds, but not patent. That is correct. Right. And we'll get into that. A warranty deed is under administrative law. A land patent is under common law and constitutionally protected. Very important that you understand that. I have never been able to understand why an attorney does not turn around and go and defend. He could have business forever. Trying to help somebody save their land instead of allowing it to take it or be instrumental in taking their land. I think there's going to be an accountability to that the way I read my Bible, and I'm speaking for me here. There's a wonderful place for attorneys. I'm not throwing stones at all attorneys, I'm not. But I think there's a great problem with the priority about our legal system today. You see evidence of it everywhere, okay? The bottom of page 14, if a land grant patent is not challenged by any and all, and all claimants are talking about when you post your land patent sandwich, uh, if you're going to bring your land patent forward. That has to be done by law within 60 days of the posting. <clears throat> the first day that you post your paperwork to bring your land patent forward does not count. Because the courts have said it's got to be a full day to be counted. So you do not count. So in other words, you leave it on the bulletin board or whatever for 61 days. If there is not a challenge to the standing of your land patent, now understand this, it's got to be a legitimate challenge. It can't be a frivolous thing or you have cause of action against the perpetrator. But if somebody's got some legitimate paperwork that really needs to be taken a look at, they have 60 days to do that. If they do not, your paperwork, as well as in law, bars them from ever making a claim toward that. Okay? Alrighty. Next one, page 16. The law on rights, privileges, and immunities. 
on a land patent is, is transferred by patent in title and right of a bona fide claim purchaser will be protected. Drop to page 16. In other words, it's mandatory for the court system to protect a bona fide land patent. Gets back to the supremacy clause, doesn't it? Article 6, Clause 2, United States Constitution. All judges are bound. Now let's talk about that a moment. A judge can affirm a land patent in a lower court setting because they're bound to do that. But they cannot rule against it. They do it. But there's no lawful standing to do that. And the Constitution says, and there are case law on that, that when a judge violates his oath, he wars against the Constitution. Violating your property and your property right is a warring against the Constitution. The framers of the Constitution made it absolutely clear and I've read all the documents, I have the documents, state that that land is to be protected. Even the United States government once issued the land patent after the two year period of time cannot assault that land patent. They have two years and only two things apply of which gives them authority, the government who issued the land patent. And that's for fraud, or for obvious error in the paperwork. Only two items. Not because they feel like it, not because the political winds are blowing that direction. There has to be evidence of fraud, or there has to be true evidence of clerical error. That's only for two years. Okay? There's a time limit. There's a very famous case called Fletcher versus Peck. And it basically states, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it states there that the grantor divests his ownership and relinquishes to the grantee. There is an immediate and perpetual estoppel. An estoppel means just that. You're barred from proceeding any further. Okay? Fletcher versus Peck. It's in the book a little later on, kind of jumping ahead a little bit. Okay, go to page 18, and I stuck this in because I come from Oregon, but this equally would apply to Montana and any other state. But this just shows the preamble of the Admissions Act for Oregon when they applied to statehood and became a state. This says preamble, whereas the people of Oregon are framed and ratified and adopted the Constitution of State Government, which is a Republican in form. I want to stop there. Our Constitution guarantees both our federal Constitution and our state Constitution, all of them, that we're guaranteed a Republic form of government. Where is it? We're operating as a democracy, not a republic. That's why when you notice when we get into the land patent stuff, at the heading of the documents that I'll show you that's in the book, that it's a republic. And it has to be in that jurisdiction in order to bring that land patent forward and to make your, your certificate of acceptance. Land patents to bring forward have to be accepted. I read all kinds of stuff on the internet, I read papers, to where they only use what's called the Declaration of Land Patent. That's absolutely worthless. And the reason being, the land patent is already being declared. You can't declare that. You acknowledge it by your certificate of acceptance of that Declaration of Land Patent. You understand what I'm saying? The land patent, the letter patents, are what we define in law as prima facie evidence document. And that simply means it says what it says, and it means what it says, until it's overturned, it stands as read. It's like an affidavit of fact. 
When you give your personal testimony of events that you personally are aware of, you do it in what's called an affidavit or an affidavit of fact. Unless that's rebutted item by item within 30 days, it stands forever. So if you ever have to do an affidavit, keep that in mind. Republic form of government. We're guaranteed that and we're not practicing it. And we wonder why we've got all the problems that we have. Getting back to the two walls and the baby lamb voting what to have for lunch. That's what that means. Mob rule, if I can put it in another context. Two people can outvote one, so you lose all your personal and individual rights and you use your property. That's a democracy. Every democracy in history, and I'm an avid history buff, both biblical and our national history, has ever survived a democracy. Every single one has gone down in flame. That's what's made our country so unique, because our foundation was God-based. Our foundation was a republic. You can, can rule you better than I can, huh? And you, and you, and all the rest of you. What right have I got to come and tell you what to do, or how to do it, or when to do it? And then charge you for the, for the privilege of trying to dominate you? Insanity. Absolute insanity. That's what we're doing. I want to share a thought with you folks. And please hear what I'm saying. I believe there's three types of people in the world that I've observed in my 67 years. First one, those who make things happen. And there are some people in here who are doers. Okay? And God bless you for it. We're made by the Creator, and we need to be created with our God-given gifts, I believe. So the first one is those who make things happen. Number two is those who watch things happen. And the third one is those who wonder what happened. <laughs> Which is the majority? <laughs> Do I really need to answer that? <laughs> I appreciate your being able to do it. But understand this, folks. We laugh at that little statement that I made. But unfortunately, it's true. And having said that, I want to pose a question to every one of you in this room. Which one are you? Which one are you? Are you a person who makes things happen? Are you a person willing to make things happen? Are you willing to step out in faith and do what you can do with your God-given ability? Or are you number two? How uh, this watch? We got a lot of watchers. A lot of watchers. Or oh, are you number three? You wake up one day and what happened? I wonder what happened. We better get that back in balance. Because you are seeing the cause and effect of your land, your rights, your property, your income, your savings your retirement, wherever you want to close your eyes and point your finger. <clears throat> because remember this, our adversaries are doers. Mm -hmm. They're doers. Because we're seeing it's being done. And we're sitting here, what happened? We have a very false sense of security in this nation because we have been so blessed and so protected by God for so many years but we pushed him out and we wonder why the enemy is now just in mockery with their tail on fire coming at us the Bible says we fight not against flesh and blood but against spiritual and power, powers in high places Okay? 
We have a spiritual battle that we're seeing manifested in the physical. That's why we need the aid of Almighty God. George Washington recommended it. Do you know that every war that's ever been fought has been fought with less than two and a half percent of the populace? That's why you guys are heroes. I salute you. Revolutionary War with less than two and a half percent. The War of 1812 was less than two and a half percent. World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam, on and on it goes. A few select men and women who have set up, stood up, and stepped up to the American public and our way of life and given a blank check that may cost them their life. Okay? Freedom not free. <clears throat> Therefore, in section four, contains the proposition offered to the people of Oregon for acceptance or rejection. Part five is a percentum of the net proceeds of the sale of the public land lying within each state, said to be held and sold by Congress. And there's a whole mathematical figure that they came up with in these admission acts, etc. That the foregoing proposition herein before offered are the condition that the people of Oregon shall provide by ordinance irrevocable without cons consent of the United States that the said state shall never interfere with the primary disposal of the soil within the same of the United States or with any regulation Congress may find necessary for securing the title in said state soil to bona fide purchaser thereof, and that in no case shall a non-resident uh, <clears throat> proprietor be taxed higher than a resident. And it gives a statute there. Now that's a very interesting that is in all of the enabling acts. When the state relinquished the land, only one state in the United States did not do that. That's Texas. That's why Texas is known as the Lone Star State. That's why they call it the Republic of Texas. Texas said, we're not giving our land back. We bled, fought, and died to have this land, and we're not giving it up. But the other states did, Oregon, Montana, Idaho, and on and on and on and on. But that very thing that I read to you in the enabling act forbids the state entering any state legislation, law, enactment, policy that in princes upon your land. Okay? Another protective covenant. What we call in the law, they're called protective covenants. So when Congress was mandated by Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2, to dispose of those lands, the states had nothing to say about it. And here's why. Because of forever clause that continued down the element of time that that protective covenant to protect you and your land. You, you, you get the picture here? Very important that you understand it. If you don't, boy, speak up. Because if you don't, you don't won't understand how to protect it. It's not a self-executing document. We had an incident in Climate Falls, Oregon, 20, 25 years ago. They came after the water like they're coming after your water. 1,200 families said, you're not taking water. Just like Bundy said, you're not taking our water and our land and our grazing, whatever. And they stood up and you saw what happened. The greatest fear government has is for you to have cojones enough to stand up and say no. They came after those people water, and the day the federal agent showed up, there were 1,200 families, wives with shotguns and pistols and kids with 22s. And they said, somebody's going to bleed and die here today if you try to take our water. 
The federal agents threatened them. They said, what are you going to do? Take our water? They were trying to do that. I talked to one of those federal agents about two months after that incident. They finally turned around and said, hey, we're out of here. I'm not dying over that water. That federal agent said, that scared me to death. I have never seen the public bear arms against me. And I'm the one wearing the badge and the pistol. Said, that scared me to death. Good. Do you realize how much power you have? Yeah. That's why we have a Second Amendment. To protect your life, your family, your <clears throat> liberty, and your property. There's a place for negotiation. But when it's obvious it isn't going to work, then you better be willing to take the next stand. Are you a doer that makes things happen? You're going to watch things happen and watch our nation crumble because we don't have any guts and no backbone. That's what this is about here today, folks. We're talking about land and land patents. But it's much, much bigger than that. But that's the foundation. What is your decision? What, which one of the three are you going to be? I pose that question to you folks here today. Okay? <clears throat> At the bottom, page 18, the Act of Congress admitting Oregon into the Union on February 14th, 1859, established in the state, shall never interfere with the primary disposal of soil. Look at the word never. How long is never? Not as long as forever. <laughs> you see my correlation to the forever, and now it's never, and it's in perpetuity, which is without end. String gets longer, doesn't it? Those are protected covenants. The state's responsibility as a government is to protect you and your land and your rights. Now they work like hell and hard as they can to try to take them away from you. What are we doing? What are we doing? I look like that. Turn the next page, page. Yes. I, I guess I don't, I'm not clear on what, what's going on there. So, so Oregon become part of the United States transferred its rights. I'm sorry, sir. I've got a hearing defect from Vietnam. So, so for Oregon to become a member of the United States, it trans the state transferred its rights to its state land to the federal government. Un all unappropriated lands went into the to the, the federal trust. The trust the United States set up and treaty demanded that the, the land did not go to the United States. It went into trust land. And when the states became states, by the law of possession, then the states acquired that land and title to that land. So in order for them, they said, well, let us do the disposal. We were still trying to build a country here. Right. So then they relinquished that land back to the trust for the Congress to dispose of those land back to the individual of the state, of each of the states. Okay, so that land in all these states, but Texas is still in that land trust federal government. Federal the government. only land that's in the land trust are the public lands and the public domain. All this patented land that you folks own is out of that trust and is in your private possession, private ownership, and private authority and jurisdiction. It was transferred back that is correct. by patent title. And that's what the patent does. Okay. All right. The patent is the evidence of law. <coughs> okay. the, the ownership, the right title and interest comes from law, which is called Act of Congress. Yes. But, and uh, that trust is by law necessarily disposed of not kept in that is the correct. trust. So That's when correct. the feds have not disposed of it, they're in violation that of their own correct. law. I'm going to get into that later today about FLIPMA. How many of you know about FLIPMA? Federal Land Policy Management Act. Unlawful as it can be. So many holes in that bucket. I can compare it to a screen door in a summary. <laughs> Congress cannot self-enact an enactment 
to take the public land. Sure what I said? Public land. That is the federal land. I get irritated when people go, well, that's green oil land, that's orchard land, that's government land. No, it isn't, unless it's a military base or a shipping dock. George, folks. Yes. Change to make, I mean, you know, most of the eastern states have no federal land or very little. So what changed all the western states seem to have massive reserves that the federal government owns? What because the federal government violated the contract agreement between the states and the federal government when they agreed if they would uh, transfer the land into the, the, the federal trust for disbursement. Not for possession, but for disbursement. They didn't do that. The federal government reneged upon the contract agreement of the states. Wasn't that just the western states? Just the western states. East, excuse me, west of the Mississippi. But we're talking about the Enabling Act now. That is correct. Right. You're going to get into that later at all? Yes. And that has to do with the point in time and the realization of the great wealth of minerals and uh, resources in the western states. That is the whole reason why they did not dispose of the rest of the land. Okay. The unfortunate thing that we find, and you folks know it as well as I do, that we have greedy people in government. Mm -hmm. And we have people, greedy people who are not in government. The Bible says, it is easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. The rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? I've done all the Ten Commandments. Pat himself on the back. And it's commendable. The Lord said, yeah, you did do that. But only one thing I ask. Sell all you have and follow me. The rich young ruler turned and walked away. Lazarus in the Bible and Abraham talks about that rich young ruler, about the great crevasse, etc. Yes? Sir, um, so when we're talking about land transfers, Speak up, please. when we're talking about land transfers, from federal, uh, I mean, uh, from the states to the federal. States okay. To federal state, right. we'll say. I mean, Roosevelt and a couple presidents before that did it with executive order. Now, we're still living under that. I mean, to me, that is a growth. We didn't follow the will of the people at all. Just this morning. Let me bring that up. Thank you for that question. As Rex and I were driving in, and Joel, I got a call from one of my researchers. I got some excellent research, and these guys are phenomenal. <clears throat> I told him I, we got some issues about they want to expand the wilderness area and the monuments, tie them all together. My two counties, Jackson and Josephine County, Oregon, are the two richest independent counties of any place in the western United States. There have been mineral surveys that have been done. Enormous mineral wealth. And we're broke. Sheriff's Department has two patrolmen. It's have eight. County can't do this, can't do that. Part of that's a misappropriation of money, but that's a whole different issue. But the point that I'm making here, I've done extensive research on the Wilderness Act, and the uh, Monument Act and all of those, with the exception of two, they're all unlawful. Do you hear what I said? All but two are unlawful. It is required that those lands, if they're going to be tied up, has to have a mineral survey done. Because if you go to HR, once you write this down, HR 365, it's called the 1866 Mining Law. And I want you folks to go read that when you get a chance. It's called H.R. Henry Ron 365, called the 1866 Mining Law. It has 11 parts to that act. And that grant granted to you and I all of the minerals in the United States that has not already been claimed. You have as much right to go search for minerals, make a claim as I do. I've been in the mining business 40 years. 
true of everyone in here. That was granted, G-R-A-N-T-E-D, to you and I. Once a land is disposed, I shared with you under Fletcher versus Peck, excuse me, and many other, many other cases. That land is then divested from the United States authority and control, other than administrative for the mineral claimants that come on that land. It's called public domain. Public lands and public domain are not one and the same. Domain means that the land has not been appropriated for any use. But that does not mean that the mineral potential to acquire that mineral is not available, because it is available. Does that make any sense to you? That's why it's called a claim. You file a mining claim. Very important. When Congress disposed of those lands, the mineral I'm talking about, there can be no other claim put on it. And yet they're giving it away to, to uh, wildernesses and all of these different uh, monument areas and study areas and this and that. Totally, totally, totally unlawful. Congress does not have the authority to do that. They've already predisposed that land. Okay? There's a case law of the law on it. Okay? <clears throat> if you notice at the bottom of page 18, by the United States or any regulatory Congress may find necessary for securing the title in said soil to a bona fide purchaser thereof, and the Supremacy Clause, Property Clause, Commerce Clause, or the National Mining Law. These are elements of protection for the granting of properties within a state. Okay? Alrighty. Page 19. I threw this in. It's not applicable to Montana because Montana has its own. I just didn't have it handy to put it in the book when I need to get this down. And it's called ORS, Oregon Revised Statute 164.075. And this basically says, and I'm going to paraphrase it here for you. This says that it's a state enactment that any infringement upon your private property is a felony. Okay? It's a felony. The state and the enactments of those laws... It's theft by extortion of whatever means. And that's important for your state. You have one of these too. I just don't have the number here at this point. Very important. What is trying to tell you in all this that I've shared? Your patented land is important and it has a lot of protective covenants to it. Okay? Another benefit of all the multiple protective covenants. There's an element of law, it's Latin, it's called paramaterra. Paramaterra simply means that whenever there is a potential challenge or any legislative uh, proposed uh, enactment, they have to go back and look at all of the savings clauses together. Here's what we're doing. The legal system is picking one thing out and then they attack it from this way and that way and whatever and totally violate the protective covenants of your land and your rights. It's called paramaterra. I have a document it's called the Congressional Record of 2000. Incredible document. I want to encourage you to go look it up. I wish I'd have brought it. I'd be glad to share it with you. But they tried to take some property from people in northern Nevada. And in that, it ended up going clear to Congress for testimony. And Congressman Jim Gibbons from Nevada had addressed the issue under professional testimony, expert testimony, 
of the very fact of all of these protective covenants having to do with your roads that are under RS-2477, which means roads that are prior to 1976, are protected. The Forest Service, the BLM, cannot close those roads. There's no provision in law to do that. None. Because they have a proprietary right. And they have a right by virtue of all of the paramateria, the saving clause, for you and I to have access to our land. It's our land. It's not government land. And I get irritated when I hear, well, that's Forest Service land. I want to see the title. We're going to break to have a lunch here. I want to share one quick story with you. I was called as a consultant to a criminal charge against a miner. And this miner had found a mineral claim that had been abandoned. And I'm talking about statutory abandonment, in other words, by law, it was abandoned. In other words, it was open for him to go in and to claim that land. He did that, did the research, was clear. He claimed that land, cleaned it up, took five three-quarter ton pickup loads of trash, of metal. I, the hippies had had it and had a drug, uh, pot growing uh, operation going for a number of years. The BLM never did a thing about that. Once he filed on that manual claim, cleaned it up, cleaned it, there was a cabin there, a cute little cabin, pretty well structured, cleaned out, had mice and rats and an old sofa and recliner and cans and garbage, cleaned that all up, painted the inside. Forcer, or the BLM came along and arrested him for federal theft of federal property, or under the theft of federal property. He said, you done to tell me that that's your property? How come you didn't clean it up? That's your right. See, they're supposed to clean that stuff up. Make a long story short, took him to jail, booked him, next day turned him loose, and filed five criminal charges against him. Okay? So when he got an attorney, he said, the uh, public defender, in most instances, I'm very adamant against that because they usually sell you out. But he got a good one. Young lady, sharp gal, sharp gal. He said, I want Ron Gibson to be a consultant to you because this was related to mining. She agreed, yes, sir. So I came in, we met, she said, tell me about the mining law. We spent all afternoon giving her my reader's digest version of the mining law. I teach mining law. And she said, very interesting. So anyway, we went through the learning curve and the right of ingress and egress and the right of, of possession and the of mining claim acts as a patent, even though you don't have the paper. It has that protective covenant because it's tied to national defense. We go to court. As we're in the courtroom, the prosecutor calls four Bureau of Land Management witnesses. Your name, and I'll skip a lot of the stuff. And anyway, all of them said, the prosecutor and the attorney said, uh, this land said, well, whose land is it? And he said, uh, it's BLM land. I've got to bend over my back, folks, oh, sorry. And, uh, I'm going, she didn't hear me. Four witnesses, and finally I got a note, slipped it to Dusty, the defendant, got it. I said, call a recess. So about 10 minutes later, she called for recess. We went outside the hall. And I said, Greta, I said, you gotta call those witnesses back from the Bureau of Land Management. She said, why? And I said, because you allowed them to give testimony that the ownership of that land belonged to the Bureau of Land Management and not to Dusty Ford. Said, oh, you're right. I forgot all about that. So we go back into court. About eight, ten minutes later, she tells the judge, I want to recross examination some of the Bureau of Land Management uh, witnesses. Is that okay? So she calls him up. She did a beautiful job. 
She just absolutely filleted those witnesses. It was unbelievable. I was so proud of her. I wanted to give her a kiss. No, she did a good job. And so let me give you one instance, and then it was repeated. Then we'll go to lunch. She said, you're under oath. She says, your testimony still is subject to, you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, yeah. And uh, my mind's going 100 miles an hour. I work like that. She said, you testified earlier that this land belonged to the Bureau of Land Management, did you not? And he said, yes. <clears throat> she said, uh, well, then, do you have the title with you? And the guy said, pardon me? She said, the question I ask you, do you claim that you gave personal testimony under oath that you, in fact, testified that this was BLM land? Is that correct? And he said, yes. She said, do you have the, the title with you? He said, well, no. She said, well, do you have it at your office? I said, well, no. She said, well, is it anywhere in the BLM building in Medford? Well, I don't know. She said, wait a minute. You testified that under oath that this was BLM land. I want to know how you know it's BLM land. Where's the title? Have you seen the title? No. Have you ever not known anybody that saw the title? No. I mean, she just carves this guy's testimony up. It was beautiful. <laughs> She said, then what you're telling us in this court, that you perjured yourself because you don't know that it belongs to the Bureau of Land Management, do you? Well, I'm sure it does. She said, that isn't my question. Do you or do you not know that this land belongs to the Bureau of Land Management? She said, you don't, do you? Because you can't produce the title. You haven't seen the title. You just testify to that, which is it. You testified before that you knew it was. Now you're saying you don't know. So what that tells me is in the court, you don't know. Isn't that correct? Oh, well, yeah. You're excused. Call two more of the four. She called total of three. She then calls Dusty Ford, my friend. Puts him on, gives his name, all of the pertinent stuff like attorneys do. Said, Mr. Ford, do you believe that you have a right to that land? He said, yes, ma'am, I do. She said, on what basis do you have a right to that land? He said, by my title. The whole jury, they straightened up. She said, title? He said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, do you have a title with you? He said, yes, ma'am, I do. She said, may I see it? He said, yes, ma'am. Opened his coat up, pulled out, had a eight and a half by eleven folded up. She said, would you please tell the court what this is? Said, this is my mental claim filing, which I did in accordance with the law, signed it, dated it, paid the fee to the county, had it properly recorded, and he pointed to it, and she held it there for him. Said, then I sent it to the Bureau of Land Management in Portland, Oregon, and they accepted it, stamped it, and issued me an ORMC number. She said, would you tell the court what an ORMC number is? That's Oregon Mining Recorded um, Plain. Plain. Authority. Plain. ORMC, Oregon Recorded Mining Claim, excuse me. <laughs> and it said, they issue a number. She said, that's his number at the top. And he said, that by law is my title. She said, well, how do you know it's your title? He said, Title 30, Section 53, the law of possession. One of the jurors said, may I see that? Attorney said, your honor? said, you bet. She hands him the document. She said, all the jurors are trying to see that document. <clears throat> Passed it around. It took the, the jury less than 10 minutes, not guilty on all counts. That's what your patent title is to do for you. 
Okay? It's your title. It belongs to you and to you alone. Not to the state, not to the government, not to the EPA, none of that. Quickly, let's move on. <clears throat> I'm going to jump around here a little bit, the reason being we need to cover a subject here very quickly about how to bring your land path forward. I don't want us to run out of time because what I want to do, or like to do, but it's up to you. <clears throat> Toward the end of the day, I'd like to have at least an hour and a half, maybe two hours of question and answer. Uh, so I'd like to cover this stuff because probably a lot of your uh, <clears throat> questions are going to be related to this. But before we go any further, I want to read you something that's a case. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this case is called the City of Dallas versus Mitchell. And I want to read this to you. It said, the right of the individuals are not derived from governmental agencies either municipal, state, or federal, or even the Constitution. Remember what I shared with you earlier that our rights are inalienable. The Constitution just reaffirmed them, okay? And also the Constitution puts a limit on the government. They exist inherently in every man by endowment of their creator, and are merely reaffirmed in the Constitution and restricted only, listen to this carefully, restricted only to the extent that they have been voluntarily surrendered by the citizenship to the agencies of government. Hello? Let me read it again. You better catch this, folks. And it doesn't get any more important than this. Your rights, they exist inherently in every man by the endowment of our Creator and are merely reaffirmed in the Constitution and restricted only, only to the extent that they have been voluntarily surrendered by the citizenship to the agencies of government. Wow. Give us that sighting again. Mitch, the city of Dallas, it's in the book. It's in the book. Yes. And I juxtapose this with the Erie Railroad Doctrine. I'm familiar with that. Where, I'm sorry, Joe, I can hear you. Can I juxtapose this with the Erie Railroad Doctrine when 1934, it was presumed that everybody has given up their right to become a federal person. You have no right. If you have a social security number, any sovereignty you used to have has been overlaid. You have none. Yes. Now I want you to understand what's being said here. <clears throat> Remember me addressing the issue of jurisdiction and authority or authority and jurisdiction? You're the king, folks. I want to go back. This book is called The Constitution for the United States of America. Do you know that when this was drafted, it went to the Commonwealth of Delaware with the first recipients of the constitutional draft for signing. The people in the Commonwealth of Delaware said, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's something missing. And I don't know, I can't find enough of the record to make a positive determination, but it brings me to the conclusion of two potential causes. They added the first sentence to this document, and the first three words are what? We the people. We the people. Little did they know, or maybe they did know, by divine intervention, I don't know. But that, based upon our constitutional document, made you and I kings of our land. Okay? And I said earlier, we need to stop acting like slaves and start functioning like kings. 
Because you are. It's your decision. Remember, we talked about the three people. Let me read the rest of this quickly. <clears throat> the people's rights are derived from <clears throat> the government, but the government's are not derived by the government, excuse me, but the government's authority comes from the people. We're the boss. We're the king. That's where administrative law has switched 180 degrees. Now the government wants to be the boss and we're the slaves. <laughs> the Constitution <laughs> states again that these rights already exist and that the legislative encroachment by nation, state, or municipality invade those, those original and permanent rights. Permanent rights. Permanent rights. What's permanent mean? Without end, isn't it? Forever, however you want to define it. In perpetuity, all of those are molded into one. Another protective covenant, folks. You only give up your, don't have rights if you give it up. Municipality <clears throat> the of these permanent rights, it is the duty of the courts, we get back to Article 6, Clause 2, the Supremacy Clause, the duty. Most people don't even understand, especially politicians and the legal profession, what duty even means anymore. Same with uh, uh, your fiduciary responsibility. Every elected official, every hired person in government has a fiduciary responsibility to you, their boss. And why we sit still and let them tell us is beyond me. And I pray to God from this day forward that you don't put up with that. Okay? It is the duty of the courts to declare and to afford the necessary relief. The fewer restrictions that surround an individual liberty of the citizen except those for preservation of the public health, safety, and morals are more contented than the people and the more successful the republic is. Kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? I want to read to you. I have a very dear friend of mine. <clears throat> How many of you know Tom DeWeese? Have you heard of him? A few of you have. I have had the honor of being asked to be one of the featured speakers at the International Symposium on Land Rights in, in Ontario, Canada on the 4th of October. That's an international event. I'd like to invite every one of you. It's on the 4th of October. And uh, if you're interested, uh, I'll get it direct, uh, the uh, location and time and whatever. But for you folks who are really interested in this land rights thing, I'm working with some people up there, crackerjack people, sharp, sharp at this pattern stuff. One of the gals in the name of uh, uh, Marshall, boy, that gal, she's uh, pretty special. We share information back and forth, but I've had the honor of being asked to be one of the featured speakers at that event. People from all over the world are going to be there and are going to be a very interesting. Australia has a constitution. They have a patent process. Canada does, you know, people from Europe, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so I'd like to invite you and encourage you to come and go if you can. I want to read you what Tom Dewey's put together. He allowed me to put it in my book. <clears throat> the title of this is What Does Private Property Rights Mean? Go to page 47 in your book. You can follow along with me. <clears throat> page 47. Top of the page. <clears throat> I'm going to start down a little bit here at the second paragraph. As the founding father John Adams the moment the idea is admitted into society that property is not sacred as the law of God and that there is not a force of law and public justice to protect it, anarchy and tyranny commence. Oh, 
boy, does that sound familiar? <laughs> Too bad it does, doesn't it? Okay, let's go on. President Calvin Coolidge said, ultimately, property rights and personal rights are one and the same, and that's true. That comes from this book, the Bible. Okay? Because our right to land ownership is an inalienable right throughout Scripture. Ranch earned property, ranch activist Wayne Hague, if you do not have right, if you don't have the right to own and control property, then you are property. And that's true. That's why the administrative courts and all of this are trying to divest you out of your land and your home. They don't care what it costs you. They don't care how it hurts. Doesn't care whether your children have a home to go lay and become home at night and have security. A home is a security place, isn't it? It's your sanctuary, or should be. It's what it's intended to be. Are you going to give it up? Are you going to sit there and do nothing about it? It's your choice. Private property means, and I want you to, to follow along with me in it because boy, this is important. The owner's exclusive authority to determine how property of his or her property is used. That's a property right. And that gets back to your question here, sir, about some of the bullet point issues. And I think this probably answered that as well as I could of anything that I could say. Number two, the owner's peaceful possession, control, and enjoyment of his or her legally granted purchase or dated property or private property. Number three, the owner's ability to make contracts to sell, rent, or to give away all or part of the legally granted purchase deeded private property. The local, county, city, state, and federal government are prohibited from exercising eminent domain for the sole purpose of acquiring legally purchased deeded private property so as to resell <clears throat> to a private interest or to generate revenue. Well, we see that all over, don't we? Okay. <clears throat> I want to go back to the top of the page a minute. I saw something that I forgot. Let me read that first. The Fifth Amendment <clears throat> treaties by the Washington State Supreme uh, Court Justice Richard Sanders, <clears throat> and he writes, and I quote, Our state and most other states define property in an extremely broad sense. That definition is as follows. Property is a thing that consists not merely of its ownership and possession, but of its unrestricted right of use. Anybody here in Montana got land use restrictions on your property? Do, don't you? Boy, is this thing a lot. <clears throat> but their unrestricted right of use, enjoyment, and disposal. Anything that destroys any of the elements of property to that extent destroys the property itself. The substantial value of property lies with its use. You get that? That's why you want to make good benefit and use of your land and your water. If the right of the use is denied, the value of the property <clears throat> is diminished. And the ownership is rendered a barren right. A barren right. What's it mean when something is barren? Doesn't produce anything, does it? And I don't just mean the growth. When you're restricted of your land and like somebody got their hand around your throat. Okay, let's go on to number five, page 48. That no local, county, state, or federal government has the authority to impose directives, ordinances, fees, fines regarding these <clears throat> landscaping, color, selection of trees, planting, preservations, or all of this other stuff, or open space, or legally purchased, deeded private property. You go to build a house, they want you to put a plant here, they want you to put this over there, put a bunch of garbage. 
Number six, that no local city, county, or federal government shall implement a land use plan that requires any part of your legal possessed, needed, or private property to be set aside for public use or for natural resource protection areas, directing that no conservation or disturbances may occur. Boy, we see that, don't we? Number seven, that no local city, county, state, or federal government shall implement a law or ordinance restricting the number of dwellings that may be placed on the legally purchased needed property, private property. Number eight, that no local city, county, state, or federal government shall alter the imposed zoning restrictions or restrictions that will devalue or limit the ability to sell legally purchased needed private property. Number 10, that no local, city, county, or federal government representative <clears throat> or their assigned agents may, may enter private property without written permission to the property owner or as to the possession of an unlawful warrant from a legit, <clears throat> legitimate court of law. This includes invasion of private rights and privacy <clears throat> by government use is un man drone flights. You realize your property goes up in the air? Yeah. I don't know if you knew that. I want to mention anything that has to do with water on your land, it could be a drill well, a spring, artesian, pond, belongs to you. A lot of the states now want to try to have uh, permits for your well. Don't ever do that. Whatever you do, don't give up your water. Oh. Yes. Some of the well drillers won't, won't drill a well because they think you have to have a permit. Well, well find another there's a way around that. Okay. What about rainwater? Well, I'm not talking so much about the permit of the drilling, but I'm talking about more of the monitoring your wells after they're drilled. Well, I know what uh, I talk to people in the state of Washington. They own a piece of property. They will not let them drill a well there. So there's no water. They can only live on their property four months out of the year. Well, they need to stand up and do something about that, Heather. Oh, that illustrates my point. We claim we're free, and yet we're allowing all of this stuff to choke us and choke us and choke us and choke us. <coughs> Which are you, a king or are you a slave? Case in point, at the bottom of page 48, neither a town nor its officers have any right to appropriately <coughs> or interfere <coughs> me, with private property. Mitchell versus City of Rockland. Brings up another question. How about all these covenants that you're supposed to sign before you can buy a property that's, 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 that's not done by the city or thing, but some kind of a, a, a board of a subdivision or something? Homeowners Association. I personally have been involved in a very similar situation. And we got together and we went and we bought a drill rig ourselves. We drilled our own well, put our own casing in. That ended the argument. There's an old saying, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is for permission. <laughs> okay? Yep. Well, they want to tell you you can't park a car in your driveway. They want to tell you, you know, the... What, what did you just read? Yeah. Don't live there. Are you going to surrender voluntarily to that? You're only subject to that if you yield to it. Well, they, 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 I guess they make you sign an agreement before they sell you the property. Don't buy there. Well, don't buy, don't buy, don't if, buy if that's a term and condition, I would say you keep your property. Because with restriction on it, you have no property. You may have a dwelling place, but you have no property. Because then you are property. <coughs> All right, I want to skip over to page 115. We're going to get into the patent issue. A lot of you are curious about that, and rightfully so. <clears throat> page 115. 
steps to your land patent. The first thing that you need to do is to get a copy or pull your copy or wherever your copy is. But in addition, you get a certified copy out of the county recorder's office. Is if